morning. It is a beautiful morning. Hope you guys uh, appreciate that time change. Maybe an extra hour of sleep for some. So a couple of announcements. Uh, we do have the school holidays coming up. So this Friday, we'll still have the Friday night Bible study for youth and the adults here at church. But the following two Fridays will be off for school holidays. During that time, we'll have uh, church camp as well. So that should be great. Uh, we also will be receiving communion today. So we have our gluten-free, alcohol-free offering. <laughs> and uh, so what we'll do is, uh, toward the end of the message, I'll invite everyone to come forward to receive of that, and we'll just uh, pray together before we partake, and that's uh, for open to all believers. So if you're a Christian, and you are welcome and invited to receive of that. So it's, it's great to remember our Savior and his demonstration of love for us, and how faithful and good he is. Um, what an awesome God. Great songs today, just directing us to exalt our risen, glorious King. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for being our Father, for being awesome in all your ways and creating this world and, and opening our eyes to see you, for being patient with us when we were rebellious against you, while we continue to struggle and go our own way. And uh, thank you that you draw us to yourself, that you pursue us, that your love is, is forever. And nothing can separate us from your love. And we thank you for your wisdom and your word and that you don't hide things from us. You, you instruct us in your truth and you tell us the right way to live. And I pray that we would hear you, Lord, and obey. We'd be like that wise man who built his house upon the rock. And uh, may we be immovable, steadfast, uh, holding fast to your word and your truth. And so I pray, Lord, you'd fill us with your spirit. You'd give us understanding of your word and that we would be responsive to you. Our praise would be a response of our adoration for you, not to get something from you, but because we've received you. And I pray that you would bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Romans 13, starting in verse 1, is where we'll be. The Bible is full of hard sayings. Some are hard because we don't understand them. We're just like, I really don't know what that means. Or sometimes they're hard because we do understand them and we do don't know how to do, we know we can't do them, or we don't want to do them. And Bible passages are hard when they expose our sin, they expose our need to change and to do what we're incapable of doing on our own. I was thinking of God's words to Ezekiel the prophet, and he, he told him this, and then he shared this in Ezekiel 33, 31. It says, so they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And so the prophet hears this from the Lord and he stands before the people and he says this to them. That was hard for him to say, and it was probably hard for them to hear. Like they had been exposed as people just like, yeah, it's like hearing a song. It's not changing them. Hearing God's word was not changing them because they weren't obeying God's word. Jesus had disciples that stopped following him because of the hard sayings that he said. They weren't able to receive them, and it's because their hearts were harder than the sayings. They were unwilling to yield to what Jesus, the son of God, said. As we who call on Jesus as our Lord and Savior, it's for us to draw near to him, to say, Lord, I'm opening my mouth wide in faith. Fill it. I want to hear from you. I need to hear from you. I need your guidance in my life. I need your wisdom. And he will give us his wisdom. And what I love about God is he doesn't hold back from telling us the whole truth, the truth about ourselves, telling us what we need to hear gently and persistently. And we see in the Bible, sometimes God's voice boomed from the heavens and made the earth shake. Other times he spoke in a still small voice. And Jesus Christ speaks to us through the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And it's always in, in agreement with the word of God. And he puts thoughts in our mind that are not our thoughts. His ways and thoughts are higher than ours. And because of that, 
He says things that are confronting to us because we're the ones who need to change. And if we don't find anything God says confronting, then we're not listening very well because he, he wants us to be more like him. He wants to refine us. We need this refinement because we know none of us are perfect. And I think it's important to read through the whole Bible to invite God to speak to our need, not to just camp in a, in a subject that's comfortable or our preference. Now, this letter to the Romans, it was written at a time of persecution of the church, great persecution where the Jews, um, the Jewish rulers and the Romans were persecuting Christians. They were killing them for their faith. And there was this great temptation to hate their oppressors, to, to despise their enemies, to hold grudges against those who delighted to kill and oppress them. And we can be so intent on seeing the wicked brought to justice, we can forget our debt of love to them that we are called to love them, even our enemies, to be praying for them. And if we hated our own sin as much as we hate sin in society, we would be better witnesses for Jesus because then the light of Jesus would be shining through us uh, clearer and brighter. So Romans 13, starting in verse one. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. The soul, it's not just the most in, like the most inmost part of us, it's the totality of us. It is our heart, our will, our mind, our body, and our social context, our whole being. And by the mercies of God, we're called to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. It's our reasonable service by doing his will. And he's gone through from chapter 12 on, Paul's talked about ways that that looks like to present yourself as a living sacrifice by renewing our minds according to the word of God, by loving one another as he loves us. And now by subjecting ourselves to ordinances or to the government, to those who are in authority over us. And he says, there's no authority except which has been appointed by God. You see authority, God has put that authority in place. Now we're living in a season where perhaps there is a, a great um, distrust or dislike of government. We have these polarizing views we can have. And perhaps because we live in an era of democracy, we have a vested and emotional, uh, right, emotional investment into how government is run because the people are supposed to be um, you know, representing their people who vote for them. And I imagine that Paul's words, they were very difficult for the Jewish people to swallow because Nero was uh, emperor at a stage. Um, there were zealots who wanted to be free of Roman rule. Jesus called Simon the zealot to be his disciple. And that was a group of first century. It was a political movement that their whole purpose was to incite rebellion against the Roman government, to, to undermine it and ruin it. And Jesus called the zealot to be his disciple. And then he says, let every soul be subject, submit to the governing authorities. Don't even resist them. And this was a hard saying. It's like, well, do you know what they're doing? Do you know what they're up to? Do you see what they've done to us? What Paul said likely rubbed zealots the wrong way. Maybe it has a similar effect on you. And I've learned by personal experience and observation that people generally do not like to be told what to do or how to do it when they believe it's their right to do as they please, right? We don't like being told what to do. At least I don't. I will admit that freely. And not only were the disciples to be subject to government, to not incite rebellion, not to and not even to resist authority because that had been established by God. It didn't matter if elections seemed rigged or if, if one became a ruler by killing the previous emperor and took their place. And you're like, that was wrong what they did. They're still ordained and established by God. It seemed unfair. And there's something likely in all of us that immediately when we read something like this begins to make exceptions in our mind where it should not be true that our resistance would be just and noble because we answer to a higher power. 
And so we can disregard what the government is saying or doing because we answer to God. Well, God says we're to submit to the government, to those in authority. So if you say you answer to God, well, what is your calling? To submit to the authority he has established by faith in him, knowing he's done it. So to resist the governing authorities is to resist the ordinance of God. And as a consequence, it says you will bring judgment upon yourself. Proud Nebuchadnezzar, he's walking in his palace. He's quite pleased with himself and what he's done. And God's plan was to humble him. And this is from Nebuchadnezzar's mouth, talking about his dream. So that the living may know the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. So God would humble Nebuchadnezzar so he would be an example of like God lifts up people into a position of authority. He can also take it away from them in a moment. Their mind can be gone because God has established authority. And some point out that it is justifiable to disobey those in authority who tell us to disobey God. This is true. There's a time when wives should not submit to their husbands. Like when Ananias and Sapphira decided to lie. Sapphira did not need to submit to her husband in that deceit before Peter. She could said, no, I'm not going to lie. I'm going to tell the truth about the price of the land. There's a time when a child should not obey their parents if they're directed to sin. It's kind of like um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the children of God. Their ruler said, bow down to my image at the sound of the music. And they go, no, king. You are our king, we respect you, but we will not bow down to your image, even if it costs us our lives, because we bow down to God. We answer to him. God has our ultimate allegiance. The Jewish rulers, they commanded the apostles, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. And they answered in Acts 4, 19 and 20. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So they were going to be obedient to God. And since obedient to God is paramount, we are to obey and be subject to the governing authorities, knowing they have been established by God. This is a challenge to our faith, isn't it? That God has established them. Today, it's illegal in some places to be a Christian. And if and when this happens in our fair land, we can know that God's allowed it for his good purposes and we can obey him over all. So we're not hindered at all from following God, from being God's faithful subjects. Verse three, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. I had a coworker who said that driving for him was a pretty stressful experience if he had some illegal contraband in his car. He was always looking over his shoulder and he's like, I hope that cop isn't following me. Like, I don't want to be pulled over because I, I know that I have some stuff on me that if he finds it, I could be in trouble. If he didn't, have, his license was suspended. He's, he's uncomfortable, right? He's, he's anxious to be found out. And some people like won't even pull over because they're concerned that a crooked cop might try to plant something in their car. But the point is, when you obey the law, you don't need to fear punishment from the law. In a corrupt regime, there can be good men. In a good government, there can be corrupt men. Uh, Sometimes we can just think about government as, as a disembodied thing, but it's run by people. And God can put God-fearing people in those places of authority. Our God-appointed duty is to be subject to the authorities, do what the government requires of us, and when we keep the law, we shouldn't expect trouble from the law. And it's not fitting on this subject to begin to slide our personal convictions in. Because we'll, get about, we'll talk about that in the next chapter. To make exceptions for ourselves, which we are very... It's very easy for us to do, to justify our choices. Exceptions are possible, but let's not make exceptions our rule of life. Let's look at the big picture and what God has said, that we are to be subject to the governing authorities. By faith in God, who appointed those rulers to a position of authority, our subjection is demonstrated by subjection to, him, to them. Now, they are ministers for our good. 
If those in positions of government are corrupt or wicked, they're not fulfilling God's ordained purpose, he will hold them to account. We don't need to hold them to account. He will. He's the one who appointed them. They answer to him. We also answer to him. So we are called to be obedient to those he has put in authority. And it says that God established government to avenge wrongs, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And when a government or justice system neglects to do this, they've neglected their God-given duty. This, of course, doesn't negate our responsibility to honor them, to be subject to them. And he says, rulers do not bear the sword in vain. We see after the great flood that God instituted capital punishment for murder in Genesis 9-6. He said, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. Since the flood, therefore, God gave authority and responsibility to mankind to uphold his justice, to see that murderers are held to account by justly executing them. Now, we know that capital punishment has largely fallen out of favor uh, in the world to the point that governments like ours forbid its practice, thus having failed to uphold God's justice. It's happened, as Jesus has said, that because of lawlessness, the love of many has grown cold. Now, if we say we love God, but we hate our brother, we lie. If we call Jesus Lord and we refuse to submit to the government, it's hypocrisy. And we need to confess that as sin and repent. The answer for society's ills is not just uh, instituting or restoring capital punishment. It's in your submission to God. It's in my obedience to God Obedience to Christ in faith, loving one another as he's loved me by obeying him. That's where it begins. It begins with me. It begins with you. Romans 13 verse 5. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. We ought to subject ourselves to rulers, not just to avoid punishment for our crimes, but for conscience sake. And God's given us all a conscience where we know right from wrong. It prompts us to walk correctly even when no one's watching us, right? We drive the speed limit even if there's no uh, safety cameras around. We, it means, and this is very challenging to me, that when you've paid for tolls and the toll road has been reduced to 40 for roadworks and there's no one working at all, that you actually go 40. Oh, that is a big challenge for me. And the subjection to rulers, it includes paying tax. I read that dishonesty when filing taxes is rife, even in Australia, that in 2008, it identified Australians are responsible, it said, for stealing almost $9 billion. It said for every $1 in tax avoided by multinationals and other large companies, $3 is cheated by individual tax paper, payers much of it aided and abetted by accountants. Now, I like to use the word like pocketed or kept or neglected to pay, not steal or cheated, but that's the truth. Every person, whether you're in government, a corporation, a business, a citizen, we will answer to God for our honesty concerning our collecting and filing of taxes. It's a hot button issue, even for the Jews. Like, Jesus was asked, should we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And he says, show me a coin. They held up a denarius. And he said, render to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what is God's. And the implication is the Jews had an obligation to pay taxes to Caesar because the money they used and wanted more of for themselves, it bore Caesar's image. They were using his money. The spiritual implication is that as people created in God's image, we ought to give God his just due, which is ourselves. We give him ourselves and all that we possess for his glory. Included in this list, we're obligated to give taxes, customs, fear, and honor. You know that God, I believe he delights in putting us in situations where our honesty can potentially cost us. Where honesty, there's a price to pay for honesty. 
Are you willing to pay that price to see it as a necessary sacrifice or to avoid paying what seems unfair? And maybe you can say this is unfair and maybe it is. We can feel taxes we're already paying are exorbitant. How about when you're on a plane and you really weren't prepared for this, but you're flying back on a plane and it says anything over a thousand dollars you need to declare. And you're like, hmm. Oh yeah, I bought that thing. Is it worth $999? Or do I put down the full amount? I declare the thing. And I've got to stand in that line, the extra long line. When renewing car insurance, I was so tempted to lie because we had moved house and I couldn't park in the driveway. You know, there's a different fee if you you park your car in a garage or if you park it on the driveway or on the street. So I went from in the garage to on the street. And there's this thought like, are they actually going to come to my house and see if I'm parked on the street or in my driveway? To them, who cares if I have a, I could have a four car garage. All my cars are in the garage on my insurance report. When I'm parking on the street, I struggled with that. I, God helped me um, to pay that extra. You know, we're called to render fear and respect to those who may not be fearsome or respectable. To honor those uh, because honor is due. Because God gave them that position. Not because they've been doing a good job or they've been having our well-being in mind. David was urged by his men to kill King Saul. They're like, this is the opportunity. God has delivered your enemy into your hand. David went, instead of killing him, just cut off the corner of his robe. And it says his heart smote him. His conscience was like, oh no, I did a terrible thing. I lifted up my hand against God's anointed. Even just to show him that I had opportunity to kill him, but I didn't. He's like, I I damaged his clothing, and that was wrong. It was wrong of me to do. So we need to be on guard against compromise, against justifying ourselves. And we think, well, it's not like I'm killing someone or anything. But regardless if you agree with the prime minister or the leader of the opposition, we're called to honor and respect them both, not as representatives of a party or of the people, but of God. People that God have put there for his purposes. Is this a hard saying? May the Lord melt our hearts to receive it. May he change the way that we think about these things. We can honor those in leadership by thanking God for them. As it says in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 4. Have you been doing that? Have you been thanking God for those in leadership that you don't agree with or they're not part of your party? It says, therefore I exhort first of all that's that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. We are so blessed that we can gather in Christ's name and proclaim his word in Australia. And even if we're hindered or prohibited for doing so, nothing prevents us from leading a peaceable life in holiness and godliness. God can move the hearts of rulers however he wants, but we don't need legislation to see lives changed by the gospel, to see people come to Christ and be redeemed by his grace. Verse 10, excuse me, 8. 8 through 10. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in, in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Some have taken this passage to mean that being in financial debt is a sin. But that's not what Paul means, what he says here. It's no more a sin to loan than to borrow. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 42, he said, Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Based upon a parable, Jesus told, It is wiser to put your money in a bank and collect interest on it rather than to bury it in the ground. The point that's being made here is that we should not continue in debt to others when we can pay them back. 
that we are spending on ourselves what we should be repaying to them. The debt we owe everyone, however, even if you're not in financial debt, is to love one another. And this is a debt that you will always continually owe. You owe them. You may think, I don't owe that guy nothing. Bad English, but that could be how we think. Yeah, you do. You owe that person to love him. And even when you've loved him, you, you owe him to keep loving him. A hard saying. The Bible Knowledge Commentary says, this is not a prohibition against a proper use of credit. It is an underscoring of a Christian's obligation to express divine love in all interpersonal relationships. Loving one another, it's the fulfillment of the law. And love, it completes it. It finishes it. From Exodus 20, Paul quotes the 7th, 6th, 8th, and 10th commandments to show that if you're loving people, you will not be killing them. You will not be stealing from them. You will not be coveting their things because you're loving them. You celebrate their successes and their prosperity, not wanting it for yourself. Not only does it keep us from sinning against them when we love them, but it inspires us to help them and to bless them. God commanded his people in Leviticus 19, 18, which he quotes from, you shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. When you love God and his and people, we will not take vengeance when we suffer wrong. And nor are we ever entitled to hold a grudge against anybody. Do you know that you can act friendly and kind towards someone who you hold a grudge against? You can act very friendly. There could be another Christian in this room right now, even me, that you have a grudge with for something that's said, that was done, or was not said or done. Vengeance, it's getting back at someone. It's wanting them to pay in some way. It's the poison of resentment and remembrance of past wrongs. And even as drinking alcohol to excess, it can negatively impair our judgment. Grudges do too, because they intoxicate us into this perpetual cycle of condemning others and justifying our bitterness and vengeance towards them. The law commanded, this wasn't a New Testament thing. The law commanded for people to love their neighbor as themselves. Jesus commanded that we are to love one another as he loves us in that sacrificial way that only God can because God now dwells within us. God's love is patient. God's love is kind. It keeps no record of wrongs. It doesn't delight when others suffer feels compassion. It cares about others enough to admit that they've offended you to even rebuke them to the end. Your relationship could be restored when it's soured on your end. They, you, they may not have something against you, but if you have something against them, we're called to go to them, to entreat with them, to win our brother. Love is willing and glad to make that personal sacrifice for others. Romans 13 verse 11. And do this knowing the time. And now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than first we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. It begins, and do this. What are we to do? Love one another as Jesus loved us. And we are to love knowing we are in the last days, the last hours that our time is short our remaining days on earth, it may be, we think maybe how many years do I have left? Our days may be better measured by days or hours of time we have left because we don't know how much time we have left. We see both on the Mount of Transfiguration, when Jesus is clothed in glory, he's talking to Moses and Elijah. Also in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying before his crucifixion, He's being attended to by angels. What were the disciples doing in both scenes? Sleeping. They were sleeping. Jesus is in glory. They wake up out of their slumber and like, wow, what's going on? They were senseless, sleeping, just like we can be when Jesus is with us and he's glorious. He's in glory. 
Now, Paul's not talking about depriving your body from sleep. He's exhorting Christians to wake up from spiritual sleep. Because as believers, we are always on call. We're always on the job. We're always called to be loving people. It's a problem when you oversleep and you miss work. It's also a problem when you fall asleep at work. Right? That employee is not going to be employed too long. Remember a guy, it's like, oh man, so I was working construction. And I did not grow in respect of him when he said this. But he's like, man, I really need to get back into security again because then I can sleep on the job. I was like, boy, it's a good thing your employer did not just hear what you said. You wish you were sleeping right now. It feels like you're sleeping right now. Kind of like a person that receives the company car, the company phone. That's like, we can call you 24 hours a day. Now, because we need sleep, we're limited in how on call we can be. We can only be one place at one time. But see, God, he has us on call like that. He's given us his spirit. He makes us aware of things. Maybe in the middle of the night, you're awoke, you're awakened, and you're like, this person's on your mind to be praying for. And so you can be praying for them. And that's awesome. We're called by Jesus to continually love one another. And it's like many years have passed since you've, possibly many years have passed since you first trusted Christ. You are therefore closer to the rapture of the church, the coming of Jesus in judgment, the end of your life on earth. It's closer now than ever before. And so we need to keep that in the forefront of our mind to encourage us and exhort us to be loving as he is. And these verses, they're like a spiritual alarm clock, not to prepare to survive an apocalypse, but to love one another. That's what we're called to. Not to bunker down, but to love. Continuing in sin, it brings spiritual slumber. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 6. If we're in sin without repentance... Our ears begin closed, they, they begin to be closed to God's voice. We begin to be blinded to his guidance. Things become cloudy and we become insensible. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 6. Paul writes, Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. It's like a soldier on duty. A soldier is tasked to keep, be alert, be alert, to be paying attention to things that other people are not paying attention to, to keep your eyes open when you would feel like sleeping or maybe be tired, to be focused. That's what we're called to as Christians, to be looking to Jesus to be observant and self-controlled, to love God and love others. We're called to prepare by casting off the sinful works of the flesh, to repent, to put on the armor of light. You have to put off the works of darkness before you can put on the Lord Jesus Christ and walk in the new, in newness of life. It's like Lazarus, right? He was dead in the tomb. Jesus calls him forth and he says, like, remove those grave clothes from him. The grave clothes that still smelled of death, they had to be stripped from him so he could be cleansed and clothed with clean clothes. And in the same way, you're not to put your robe of righteousness over those stinky grave clothes. They've got to come off. They need to be removed. We need to be washed. Then we can put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. As it says in this next bit, Verse 13, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. You know, there's a proper, decent, and honest way to live our lives. There's a right way to walk in following Jesus. And everyone has a different gait Everyone has a different style of walking physically, but there is a way, Jesus is the way, that we are to be living daily. Think of Jacob. After God touched him, he walked with a limp. It was obvious to everyone who saw him, like something happened to him. What was it? And I wonder if they asked him, hey, what happened to you? Maybe they got to know him for a while and they're having a feast. And I noticed that you, you walk funny. What happened to you? Well, God touched me. God changed me. 
He revealed himself to me. He gave me a new name. And he had this testimony based upon his limp that it showed that he was a man of God. He had been touched by God. And Paul holds forth examples of what works of darkness look like. You go, what's that? Well, these are things that are popular to this day. Drunken parties, sex outside of marriage, uh, lust without restraint, having contempt for the bounds of morality and law, being envious, being contentious. Those people here that people today, they've never slept with a temple prostitute, but they've been prostituting themselves to pornography, even from a young age. They've been feeding this insatiable lust and it's destroying you. When we're called to live in freedom, we're called to walk in the light of God's word. We're called to have the mind of Christ. So it's contrary to it's leading people to destruction. So why should we continue down that path when Jesus saved us from that? Having put off sin, we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the armor we wear who guards us and his righteousness shines through us. So we're to make no provision for the flesh to obey it, to feed it in common language. I'll say, get rid of your stash. No more secret stash. Be done with that. That stash of narcotics, that pornography, that alcohol, whatever has its fangs in your soul, it's got to go. You need to get rid of it. It's supposed to have no part in your life as a believer. Also, it means that stash of selfishness, those grudges, that covetousness, the pride, the self-pity, your envy. It needs to be confessed and forsaken. You don't have to go back to that anymore because you have a new identity in Christ. Get rid of the stash of trying to cover up your sin or justify it when it comes to rebellion from those God has put in authority. And be honest about your taxes. Be honest about what you declare. And it's good for us to acknowledge our areas of weakness. How we're prone to sin. To take positive steps to keep it from us. To remove it from our lives. And it does little good though if we put off the works of the flesh and we don't put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because then we won't have any strength to do what's right. And know that God's prohibitions are always have a positive side. It's not just don't do this, don't do that. It's do this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ instead of those things. Get those away from you and put on Christ. Wear him, let his life be lived through you. Turning your Bibles to Ephesians chapter five. As God's children forgiven of our sins, Paul exhorts us. I'm just gonna read this. I think it's really powerful and goes dovetails beautifully in what we've been speaking about. Ephesians 5, verses 1 to 10. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness Let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. We're called to walk in love, to follow the example of Christ. I like that, finding out what's acceptable. You often figure that out through failure. So your failures can be redeemed. Your sins can actually Be something that draws you and leads you to Christ to walk uprightly from now on. Like today is the beginning of a new day for you to walk in his ways, to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are saved not to indulge in sin, but to do what pleases him. So sexual sin, impure thoughts, words or actions, covetousness, that's not to stain your witness anymore. The dirty jokes, the harsh sledging. Instead, you should be giving thanks thanking God 
for those in authority, thanking him for his forgiveness in his life. So should we follow the pattern of those whose disobedience is leading to their destruction? No, we're not to partake with them. We are partakers of Christ who indwells us. And so we need to be putting off the works of darkness, putting on the Lord Jesus Christ and making no provision for the flesh, no stash, nothing that you're reliant upon or you fall back on to help you cope. You have Jesus, you're in him and he's in you. David had a longing for a clean heart. And I think as we remember the death of Christ on the cross, let's turn to Psalm 51. David had been called out publicly by Nathan the prophet. He came into the the courts and and told him a story and, and then said, you are the man. And then spelled out his sin. And David's like, I have sinned before the Lord. He admitted it. He acknowledged it. But this is what he wrote after he sinned with adultery and the murder of Uriah in Psalm 51. Just, we're going to read a couple little sections from this. Psalm 51, verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me acknowledgement of sin, confession that precedes repentance and repentance precedes forgiveness and cleansing. Jesus coming to the world, providing atonement with his shed blood. It was a demonstration of God's love and his mercy for sinners. And Jesus gave his life to purify us, to cleanse us, not just to redeem us from hell, not just to give us eternal life, but so his glory and righteousness would shine through us. Let's move on to verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. How awesome is this? Or you have someone who realizes their heart is filthy and corrupt before the Lord. But he's like, create in me a clean heart. Give me a new heart. And we see Jesus has done that. He is the fulfillment of this heart's desire. David cast away his sin. And God did not cast David away. He drew him close. It's so awesome that God didn't just save us from death and hell. He didn't save us just from ourselves, but having been born again, he intends to bring others to salvation through us. Because look at that end. He says, then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. That God can bring life out of death. We see that in Christ and he wants to see that in you. The things that were leading to your destruction, he saved you from those things. He's given you victory over those things. You may not feel like you're experiencing victory at all. But he tells us what to do. To be looking to him. To be trusting him. And blessed are those who are cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Salvation that's impossible. You can't save yourself. Jesus can save you. You can't help yourself. But Jesus can help you and he will. Will you acknowledge your need for him? Will you be born again and trusting him maybe for the first time or some, somewhere along the way, you stop trusting him? I pray today is the day we all start trusting him again. We all start obeying him like we've never obeyed him before. May I please invite the worship team forward and as they're singing a song, please come up and receive of the cup and the bread, and then I'll just lead us in a prayer. But the bread, it symbolizes the broken body of Jesus on the cross. The cup represents the shed blood of his new covenant that we can be washed and cleansed. And they point us to that spiritual work that God has done in each one of us when we've been born again and trusted Christ as our Savior. We're not deserving of this. By faith, we partake. By faith, we pursue Christ. And let's seek him together.
Lord, we thank you for your word and your wisdom that you do tell us hard things and at the same time, your yoke is easy and your burden is light. We thank you, Lord, that we had a debt of sin that we could never pay. And we sometimes still deal with a load of guilt and shame and grudges and rebellion and and cursing and troubles, Lord, that only you know. And thank you that you have died and you have risen from the dead to prove your victory over all of them. Thank you, Lord, that we have such a, a hope and a joy of salvation in Christ. And I pray that that would be evident on our faces, that would be evident in our thoughts and in our prayers, that we'd give thanks for those in authority. We'd give thanks to you for all that you've done and that we would walk in newness of life, making no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Thank you that you provide for all of our needs, Lord, and that you help us every step. We praise and worship and magnify you in Jesus' name. Amen.